So welcome everyone. It's great to have Dr. David Durheim with us this afternoon uh, to ask him a few, few questions that I, I think are very pertinent during this current season that we're in. Uh, David is uh, the Director of Health Protection for Hunter New England Health and also a consulting uh, professor for public health, mission, uh, public health um, medicine at the Newcastle University. I hope I've got that right. And importantly for this uh, conversation, David's right at the forefront uh, of infectious disease control and research uh, in Australia. And uh, even I believe with the United Nations and with the World Health Organization. Um, so first of all, David, I just wanted to say thank you to you and your team for, for everything that you're doing uh, on behalf of us as Australians, uh, the Newcastle region, the Hunter region, uh, in, uh, in dealing with this current pan pandemic and working to keep us, thank to keep us safe during this period. Oh, thank you, Wayne. It's, a, it's our absolute pleasure. Uh, not something that we wanted to do, but something that we must do because the costs otherwise will be too great. Wonderful. So I, I guess in light of uh, your role with Hunter New England Health, if you could perhaps elaborate a little on what you're currently involved in, uh, what it looks like for you on a day-to-day -day basis in this pandemic situation. Sure. So as you mentioned, I'm a medical doctor and a specialist in public health medicine, and I'm currently the public health controller uh, really leading the COVID hunt, uh, response in Hunter New England region. Um, that means that we spend a lot of time uh, tracking down cases and all of their contacts, making sure they are isolated. We do a lot of work in trying to get the right messages out into the community to make sure that people do the right thing, feel equipped to do the right thing to keep themselves safe. Um, I'm, I also have a scientific bias. I'm a fellow of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. And because of that, I'm also applying myself to the science. I can't help myself. So spending uh, sometimes 16 hours working in the day and then stealing some sleep time at night to make sure that I keep across the science because it is fascinating and terrifying when a new emerging infectious disease like this does occur. I've worked on three continents on infectious diseases and infectious diseases control and some of that at a global and regional level as well. Some of them old diseases like measles and polio and other emerging diseases like Ebola and, and COVID-19. Wow, so you're very well qualified to speak into this whole area. Um, and so again, thank you. And um, I know David and Jenny and um, Jonty and uh, Joanna since they uh, arrived in Australia a number of years ago from South Africa and well done on becoming Australian citizens, by the way. That was a good move. It certainly was. It's the yeah. best, best place in the world. Other than New Zealand, which has managed to eliminate <laughs> the virus. Yeah. And the other thing I know about uh, David and his family, they love God. Uh, they're a wonderful, godly family. And uh, not just talk about uh, God, but they live out their life. They're great role models uh, of what a faith life looks like. And members of one of our great local churches here in the Hunter. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. Look, my Christian belief is clearly the foundation of my entire life and, and that of Jenny, as you've mentioned, Jenny's a pastor as well. And uh, I remain astounded every day that I'm able to actually have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe. That's just amazing. Yeah. Uh, I've experienced his undeserved blessing in my life and a resurrection miracle, but that's a topic for another day. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Well said. So I, I guess as uh, simply as possible for us lay people, um, what is COVID-19? Well, we'll start with viruses. So a virus is really just a tiny amount of genetic material covered in protein. And viruses can't live by themselves. They have to parasitize either human or animal or, or plant cells. Now, this particular virus uh, gets its name because it has a spikes all over its surface and they make it look like a crown, which comes the Latin word corona. So that's why it's got the name coronavirus. And actually, there are hundreds of coronaviruses. Uh, they generally affect animal species, and in particular, the cat family, camels, and, and bats. So they commonly occur in, in bat species. But every now and then, a coronavirus will jump into humans, what we call a spillover event. 
And this has happened with seven coronaviruses in the past. Four of them are very mild. They cause about 10% of our seasonal colds. And then three were very nasty. The SARS virus that we all remember from 2002, uh, which had disappeared in 2004, that was really quite easy to contain because people only were infectious when they had, were obviously clinically sick. So that makes it easy to contain, unlike COVID. Then there was the MERS, a spillover event from camels to humans. And every now and then we still get sporadic cases, particularly in the Middle East. And now we've had this third very nasty coronavirus, COVID-19. Now, what makes it particularly nasty is those spikes that are all over its surface have the, uh, the ability to latch into any human cell that has what we call an ACE2 receptor. So if the cell has an ACE2 receptor, the virus can actually latch on, invade the cell, and then reproduce in the cell and then release itself and, and infect other cells. And unfortunately, humans, those receptors are common in our lungs, they're common in our blood vessels, they're common in our kidneys, and they're common in our gut. So that's why we are a sitting target for this horrible COVID-19 virus. Wow, wow. So COVID-19 is obviously uh, a, a real issue, um, but you'd probably be aware there have been a lot of voices around the world in media, some in the media, and unfortunately some in the church who would uh, say that COVID-19 is, uh, doesn't actually exist, that it's uh, a conspiracy by government uh, to control the masses. How would you respond to that sort of mindset? Look, there's no question in my mind that the virus is real. In fact, colleagues of mine down at Vidral in, in Melbourne were amongst the first scientists in the world to actually take the virus, grow it up in cell culture, and then distribute it to other labs in the world. And it's been very helpful because if you've got the virus, you can see how effective treatments are against it. You can use it for developing diagnostic tests, and you can use it for developing vaccines. And actually, one of my friends, and I've sent you a photo, one of my friends down in Vidral has actually taken an electron microscopic photo. You can't use an ordinary camera, you have to use an electron microscopic camera, but he's taken a photo of the virus, which is as surprisingly and frighteningly real. The reality is probably borne out by the fact that already by the end of July, over 17 million people have been diagnosed with a definitive laboratory test around the world and over 700,000 people have actually lost their lives to this virus. And I've been on the front end of speaking to bereaved families who've lost their loved ones because of this virus. And I find it really quite horribly disrespectful that there are people who are peddling conspiracy theories when I've felt the anguish of these people who've actually lost loved ones because of the virus. Wow, yeah, so um, obviously, as people of faith, we, we don't want to at all generate fear, but we need to take this seriously. Yep. Look, I think as Christians, you're right. We need to be honest. We need to be honest about the risk that the virus poses and, and really is the biggest infectious disease threat since that novel influenza virus that occurred literally a century ago at the end of the First World War in 1918, 1919. Now, we know that the, across the world, there are different rates um, of death in people that are affected by the virus. There are different factors that contribute to that. Here in highly developed countries, we're fortunate. We have fantastic intensive care units. We've got highly skilled staff. Um, and so we do better than some developing countries in places like Africa and Asia. But the age distribution of our cases, of our populations, are weighted towards older people. And we know older people do really poorly with the virus, and particularly people who've got underlying chronic diseases. And so we're finding that around the world, the death rate is somewhere between one in 200 people infected to maybe as high as five in 100. But in older groups, it can be as high as 15 to 20% of people who are infected who actually succumb and die. That's the reality of the virus. Unless we actually take that reality on, we won't take the measures that are necessary to stop its spread in our community. I guess following on from uh, those comments, David, there have been uh, a lot of talk about coronavirus being 
little more than another flu virus and we shouldn't really be uh, taking all the steps we are in shutting down uh, areas of our uh, economy, I guess, uh, the same way we wouldn't with a regular winter outbreak of flu. Uh, is there any truth in that? No, look, they are completely different viral families. We know that, that they, 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 there's, they share very few features, except for the fact that they spread by the same route, uh, respiratory droplets, and that they cause respiratory illness. The, this virus is, has a pernicious way of actually destroying and almost crystallizing the lungs in people who actually uh, die because of it, which is quite different to influenza. Influenza often makes us a little bit more susceptible to bacterial infections and bacterial pneumonia. What we are seeing is that this virus is probably even more transmissible than influenza. On average, one person leads to about two and a half additional infections, so it can spread very rapidly in the community, particularly because a person is infectious even before they're symptomatic. So for up to two days before a person's symptoms actually appear, they can be spreading the virus, but it's far more deadly than flu. So we think it's in the order of about 10 times more deadly. The death rate is about 10 times higher than the flu virus. Wow. And again, um, the media are having a field day with a lot of the things happening around about uh, coronavirus in our, in our nation as well. There's been some well-publicized incidents uh, recently with people refusing to wear masks, uh, people who are uh, defying the social distancing, a uh, whole lot of stuff happening. And um, do, you, uh, do you think that's a wise thing to be doing at, uh, when, particularly in Victoria, people are being asked to wear masks to stop the spread of the virus, but uh, saying, well, what's our right not to do that? Yeah, look, it's quite interesting. If we reflect back, um, Leviticus uh, was the first place that we know that quarantine was recorded. So it's, a, it's something our own God has actually prescribed as something that can be effective against infectious diseases. So that's its real roots. And we know that the stakes at the moment for governments are extremely high. They're trying to balance health issues, social issues, and the economy. Yes. And they really, they're unlikely to take measures uh, that are going to put those three things at risk. We've seen in Australia that the government has been pretty responsive to medical and public health advice, which has been great. And we know that these measures actually flattened that initially the first phase of the pandemic in Australia. So we know that distancing works. Getting that one and a half meters between ourselves and another person who may be infectious just gives us that safety buffer because it's droplet spread uh, to be far enough away that we don't actually breathe in the virus. Washing our hands regularly, particularly when we touch surfaces that others may have touched, actually does protect us against touching surfaces and then touching our own face and infecting ourselves. So we know those things work. We know that finding cases and isolating them and their close contacts works. We saw it with the flattening of the first wave, which is fantastic. The evidence around masks has been evolving. And that's one thing that the last five months have definitely shown us is that face masks cannot replace the distancing or the hand hygiene, but they're an additional protective measure. And if they're properly, properly applied and properly removed so that one doesn't touch the contaminated front surface of the mask and immediately use hand gel afterwards, they definitely reduce the risk further. So we'd be saying, use all of those measures. There's evidence behind of them and face masks are an additional buffer as well. Well, so you definitely recommend that people, uh, wherever possible, uh, are wearing a, a face mask. Certainly in areas where there's community transmission or you can't distance yourself. So we've seen that some of the, the larger shopping chains are now saying, look, we can't guarantee that you can keep a metre and a half okay. with other shoppers, then wear a face mask. Public transport, if I went down to Sydney with what's happening in Sydney at the moment, I'd certainly be taking a face mask with me. Hopefully we can continue to contain spread in, in uh, Newcastle, Lake Macquarie area. Uh, but if, it, if we get community transmission, then face masks are a good thing as well. Uh, thank you. One of the uh, other things that has concerned me, I guess, as a pastor, is watching, uh, particularly in some of the nations, um, church leaders defying uh, government um, 
government instructions uh, and uh, uh, having their people gather together in large numbers uh, with little social distancing, certainly no masks. Do you think that sort of response is potentially dangerous? Look, I'm, I'm, as a doctor, I'm just as disturbed as you are. It profoundly disturbs me that religious leaders would place the people who trust them and who are in their care at risk, potentially deadly risk. Um, it, 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 it boggles my mind. And, and honestly, I would strongly recommend that religious leaders do what credible political leaders have done, and that is listen to and promote credible public health guidance. I think our responsibility as Christians as well is to demonstrate love for our neighbours. And part of that is not placing them at risk. Yeah. So if we're doing the right things, we, we really are demonstrating uh, that good Samaritan attitude of not placing others at risk. Yeah. And so I guess the next question following on from that is what would you see as a, a, a good, healthy response from church leaders who have influence in, in their communities what sort of response would you like to see from some of those leaders? Look, I, I'd be very happy if church leaders and all other leaders uh, continue to take the threat seriously, at the same time conveying truthful messaging. So the measures that will protect their flock, rather yeah. than leading their flock to the abattoir, <laughs> we'd rather have them protecting their flock by actually promoting the measures that have got a strong scientific basis just to make sure that we limit the transmission in, in, uh, in our communities and in their church communities as well. Wonderful. Um, I know uh, you've been involved in vaccine research and had some input into that. Uh, and a lot of people uh, listening to this would love to know where things are up to, particularly, I guess, in regard to our own nation. What can you, uh, what are you able to tell us in regard to where things are at with a vaccine for COVID-19? Well, there are currently 189 vaccine candidates, which is amazing. We've never seen so many vaccine candidates in such a short period of time. And it speaks to the real threat that uh, this virus poses. And we're seeing new innovative ways of actually developing vaccines in a safe, effective, and in a way that may allow us to produce instead of hundreds of millions of doses, billions of doses in, in 12 month periods. So that's quite exciting. We've seen some promising early trial candidates. There are 15 candidates currently in human trials, either phase two or three. So they've gone through uh, the immune response. So they actually do produce a decent immune response in people and they're safe in small numbers. But we're now starting to ramp up those, those studies, which is very important. In Australia, we've developed two vaccines, candidate vaccines. Both of those are currently in those early uh, trials. And obviously the, there's a lot of interest in the one that was developed by the University of Queensland, which is very interesting. It's a completely novel way of producing a vaccine. It only uses the spike protein, but then uses a molecular clamp to make it very stable. And that will hopefully pro provide a really good immune response. So we may have one of the um, one of the solutions to getting out of this lockdown um, up, up north of our border at the moment. Okay. I guess uh, flowing on from that, one of the fears uh, people have, and uh, I know you've had to address it at different times because you're very much uh, uh, involved in vaccine research and uh, seeing, um, yeah, particularly when it comes to children and seeing uh, children immunised. Um, so how can people be sure that this vaccine would be safe, the integrity and the safety of this vaccine? It's very interesting balancing that the importance of safety and then this huge demand of saying, well, you've got these vaccines, they look promising in small studies, make them available now, and we can't do that. The worst thing that we could do is to roll out a vaccine where we weren't sure of its safety profile. And so this is the reason that big studies are now underway. So clearly a number of these vaccine candidates look like they're gonna be effective in the small studies and they look safe, but now we're recruiting very large numbers of people. So the two leading vaccine candidates currently in the world are going into trials now of tens of thousands of people in places which are hard hit by the virus currently, South Africa, Brazil, and the United States. 
and we're hoping that those will very rapidly give us very strong data. There is no way that the vaccine regulators are going to take shortcuts on safety. Uh, the stakes are too high. And most definitely, nobody's conspiring against us to inject us with a uh, some sort of computer chip. Um, no, no, I'm afraid um, that that is a very far flung um, and and probably ridiculous idea, Wayne. Yeah, I'm glad you said ridiculous. That would have been my next comment. Um, hydroxychloroquine, very difficult word to say. Uh, again, a lot of media, particularly in the last week, uh, a couple of doctors have come out in the US uh, talking about this and saying it is a cure for uh, a re healthy response toward um, COVID-19. Um, and a lot of confusion around that. Um, what's your feeling on hydroxychloroquine? I can't even say it, David. Chloroquine. <laughs> hydroxychloroquine. Um, what would be your response as a professional in, in that regard? Look, we would very much like a potent cure, as some, some medication that we can take that is highly effective or preventive. Uh, I, I'm a, a great fan of using the chloroquine family of drugs in malaria and have a lot of experience using them in Africa and uh, with colleagues in Papua New Guinea. But unfortunately, the, there's now compelling um, science that has been really during the month of June has been collected from very large studies, um, studies in the US and in, in Spain that have shown that there's actually no um, evidence of a protective effect in preventing um, COVID-19 infection. And then more recently, a very large study in the UK where they used this drug for treating people in a two-arm study and where there's actually a higher risk of death in those who were actually treated with hydroxychloroquine. So I think the evidence is no longer, we're not no longer waiting for the evidence. The evidence is there. And certainly as a medical professional, I wouldn't be using it. Now, there are some promising things that are coming up at the moment. We've seen in the last month, dexamethasone, the steroid, um, has been really a proven effective in very sick individuals in ICU in reducing the death rate by about a third. So that's very exciting. And obviously, what we're looking for is, is properly uh, controlled scientific studies to guide um, which are going to be the most effective treatments, either preventive treatments, which we've seen none yet with any compelling evidence, or those that will be either treating in mild cases or treating the more severe cases. So, um, yes, unfortunately, hydroxychloroquine is not the answer to this one. Okay. So before we wind up, David, uh, is there anything else you might want to add to this conversation that you feel would be helpful for people who, perhaps people who are still confused? Yeah, look, I, I can understand that confusion. I think at this, this is a time of great uncertainty and, and even fear in our community, Wayne. And I think as Christians, we have a responsibility to bring love and hope into the situation. Obviously, Christians that are on the front line will be called on to demonstrate sacrificial care and love. And that's what we expect from them. Sometimes it's hard, you know, in these sorts of situations to see where God is in the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and sometimes it's useful to remind ourselves then of the, the words that Charles Spurgeon said, that great 19th century preacher. And he said, God is too good to be unkind and he's too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. Yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. Um, well, thank you, David, for your time this afternoon. I know you're busy and uh, Sunday is your one day off with family and uh, church. And so we really do appreciate you taking time. Uh, and we thank you again to your team who are supporting you and working with you uh, during, during the season. And I just want you to know that we're praying for you. We're praying for your team and uh, praying for our nation, along with the churches of our nation right now. Uh, are praying for a, a breakthrough uh, with COVID-19, a breakthrough with this pandemic to see this thing really cut down. And uh, not just with this pandemic, but we're praying that there'll be answers provided in research that will be able to see a quicker result in the future uh, if we see outbreaks again. And so thank you so much. Thank you, Wayne.